Today, I'm going to bring a message to you in our Rooted series, our Sunday series is totally different to what's happening in the Rooted uh, groups. And I just want to tell you that we have had just an incredible amount of people participating in our Rooted series. It's unprecedented. I mean, something like well over 200 people are involved in this Rooted um, experience. And, uh, and I just want you to know as you get started in it, those of you who are in it right now, um, give it some time and allow it to do something new in your life. If you're in a group where you don't know people, awesome. That is the best possible scenario for the rooted experience. Because when you're in a group where you know everybody, you kind of limit that other person. And they limit you in a way. Do you understand what I mean by that? Because you're familiar with somebody and it's like, I don't know. But when you're in a room full of strangers, heck, you can say anything. What does it matter, right? You never have to look at them again except on Sundays. And, you know, you can wear a hat. So get in that group. Uh, if you're not in a rooted group, we're only at week two. We can catch you up, and we do want you to be in it. I don't want anybody to miss this experiential opportunity. And, uh, and our intention is to gauge where you are at when you started and what has happened in your life in 10 weeks. And we're going to be looking at those two statistics and uh, it's going to be just amazing. You'll be amazed at what God will do. So anyway, be part of that. Um, Dave and Terry, I do want to ask you to stand one more time. Thank you. Uh, Dave and Terry Williams, uh, they run our our uh, group ministry, our small group ministry. And uh, if you're not plugged in and, and not sure where to go, um, these are the ones, these two will hook you up and they will shepherd you into a beautiful situation. They'll make sure you're happy. They'll make sure it's all the right thing for you. But um, I just want everybody to thank and appreciate them for all they do. Thank you, guys. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, it is no small job to try and organize 200 and something plus people into a bunch of groups and make it all happen. And, and, and Terry actually likes that kind of thing, which is amazing. I mean, to me, it's so mind-boggling. I'm like, oh, it makes me tired. Anyway, all right, let's get into the Word. You ready for the Word? All right, so this is week four. First week, we started out talking about how God wants to plant some good things in us, and He wants our roots to go down deep into good soil. And, uh, and uh, as God plants things in us, he plants those things because he wants your life to rise up to the next level. He plants in you what will bring you to a place of strength, of wisdom, where you make great right decisions, where your future is solid because your present is solid. The seeds that he plants in your life will grow into uh, the potential of all that he has placed inside of you if you will allow those seeds to uh, become watered and, and allow those seeds to develop and to grow. We know that everything that God does begins with a seed. You were a seed, an apple was a seed, every living creature, everything that is alive begins with a seed. And what is inside the seed? The DNA, the blueprint, and all of the potential of that being, whatever it may be, a human being, a, a, a puppy, uh, an orange, a turnip, whatever it is, within it lies all that it needs to become all that it can become. Within one apple, you could pull out one seed, you could plant that one seed, and from that one seed, you could grow orchards and orchards of apple trees without end if you kept planting them because it is all contained, all of the information is contained right inside the seed. In fact, you know, scientists recently have discovered that written in the DNA code of human beings is, the, is actually the name of God shows up in the written form of your DNA. Did you know that? That God placed his signature right on your DNA. The Bible says, before you were knit together in your mother's womb, I knew you. He not only knew you, he intended you, he planned you, he planted you. He encouraged you to, to be fertilized, for you to be germinated. And, uh, and, and trust me, there was a lot of competition. But you ought to congratulate yourself. You're the one who made it. Hallelujah. 
Heck with all you other 30,000 guys. I'm, I'm, I'm first. Hey, man. You guys are all shocked now. Don't worry. I didn't say that in first service. So um, everything begins with a C. Now, you know, recently, uh, scientists, scientists, historians, whatever, archaeologists, actually, um, they discovered some seeds in an Egyptian uh, uh, pyramid, and uh, they pulled them out. They're three to 4,000 years old. And they were seeds of a now extinct uh, version of, of some grain, like wheat, barley, that sort of thing. But that particular strain was, com- was completely um, uh, extinct. They pulled these seeds out. Somebody got the bright idea. I wonder what would happen if we put them in dirt and added some water and some sunshine. Well, lo and behold, that seed germinated after three to 4,000 years. And they now have resuscitated a once extinct um, species of grain. How powerful is what is written in the seed? It is everything. It contains everything. And you, the Bible says that you are like a tree of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. The Lord is the one who planted you. The Lord is the one who wrote inside of you all that he intends for you to do and to be. And I guarantee you, it's not a person listening to me today that has maximized the full potential of all that God has placed inside you. So today we're going to take care of that. You're going to walk out of here a 2.0 version of you. You might even be a little taller when you, it's possible. So in the second week, we talked about growing uh, and how God wants us to, to grow, but it's not our responsibility to grow spiritually. It's our responsibility to provide the right environment for the seed that God plants. And the Bible says that we need, well, we all know we need water to water a seed or it won't grow, right? Whenever you hear the Bible talk about water, you can equate water to the Word. The Bible says that we are watered by the Word. So what does this mean? It means that when you provide the Word in your life, that Word that is provided, the Word of God, you you bring that into your life. Now that begins to allow what God has planted in you to grow. We're going to be looking at what God has planted in you in just a second, but, but for now, just realize you have no word in you, it's like planting a seed and adding no water. So nobody is crazy enough to think that seed's going to grow. But I'll tell you what, you just add a little water. And all of a sudden, that thing opens up and softens up and something happens. The Bible says one plants, another waters, but it's God that gives the increase. So it's God that's going to cause this thing to grow. We don't, we don't know how it grows. It's, it's miraculous. But what we do know is we've got to give it the right environment. The, the third uh, week, we talked about pruning. And, uh, and, uh, and pruning is, is where God says, you know, I can see that you've been fruitful. But I bet you could be even more fruitful. And, and God will surgically come in and remove a few things that are stealing your energy and diverting you one way or another. And, uh, and then once you've been pruned um, and he's cut away some things that, that are slowing you down, now all of a sudden you can produce so much more and better fruit. So we talked about that in the third week. And, uh, and uh, I, I read a, a T-shirt the other day, came on my computer, uh, and it said, eat a prune and start a movement. Some of you, it'll take a while for you to get that. So that's being pruned. <clears throat> anyway, I know it's rough, isn't it? <laughs> Just trying to get through this Sunday. So we're going to look at Galatians 5.22. We're going to look at some of the things that God has planted in us. This is called the fruit of the Spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit in you is where the planting of God happens. In fact, the Bible says... When we talk about the Holy Spirit, it resides in what we call the heart. Your heart, not the physical fleshy heart, but that place in you where the Spirit of God takes up residence. And so the Bible tells us, as we talked about in the first week, to guard your heart with all diligence, for out of your heart flows the issues of everything that happens in your life. If it happens in your heart, it's happening in your life. 
It doesn't happen in your life until it happens in your heart, good or bad. You know, the Bible says God is not mocked. Whatever a person sows, that is what they'll reap. How many people know that scripture? In other words, God's saying, there's no way around this. In fact, in, 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 in uh, Genesis chapter 8, right in the beginning portion of the Bible, God says, uh, as long as the earth remains, seed, time, and harvest will never cease. It's a principle of the universe. It is how all created things come to pass. Seed, comma, I know that says seed time, but we could say seed, comma, time, comma, and harvest. So we know what the seed does, we know what the harvest is, but what's in the middle? Time. It takes time to develop the seed into the harvest. And it's that between time that we get messed up often. And often we allow the enemy to sow things into the garden of our heart that begin to choke the roots of what God has intended for you to experience in your life and to have to strengthen you. So let's look at some of those things that God has, has, has given to us that we can begin to uh, develop in our life. The fruit of the Spirit, God sows it into us in seed form. It's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And the Bible says against those things, there is no law. In other words, if you do all these things, or let me say it another way, if you allow these things to develop in your life, you will be living and walking by the Spirit. Somebody, you know, sometimes the Bible says, it says things like in, 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 uh, in the book of Romans, it, it asks the question, you know, are you going to walk by the flesh or are you going to walk by the Spirit? And what on earth does that mean? How do I walk in the Spirit? You know, does that mean I go walking on the water? Does that mean I sit around cross-legged humming hallelujah? I mean, what do I do to walk in the Spirit? Well, here is, you know, finally, I'm going to clear that up for you. You walk in the Spirit by by producing, promoting, and planning, and developing love in your life. In other words, I am not going to react uh, the way my family reacts. Come on, you know all the hotheads in your family? You're not going to, you're not, just because your family's, uh, you know, got a bad temper, you don't have to have a bad temper. Just because your family's a bunch of alcoholics, you don't have to be an alcoholic. Somebody say amen. Just because you were brought up a certain way to think a certain way, uh, you don't have to act that way. You don't have to be that way. If you're going to walk in the Spirit, you're going to determine, I'm going to be loving. I'm going to love others. And I, I, when I say loving, I mean I'm going to love like Jesus loved me. I'm going to do unto others as I would have them do under me. Under me. I'm going to do uh, uh, and, and love others the way that Christ loves them. Come on. Does Christ love your enemy? Unfortunately, Yes. So what are you to do? You are to walk in love at all times. Love eliminates your, the, your, uh, the, the, the room that you might normally have to judge people, to prejudge people, to look at people in a certain way. You can't do that when you're operating in love. You can't look at a person and judge them on the, on the, on the surface if you're going to operate in love. See, love says, no, you can't go walk around judging anybody. But it's not, it's not a written rule. It's just an automatic response of, I'm going to walk in love. I'm going to walk in the Spirit. So today, I'm going to love everybody God puts in my path. I'm going to be forgiving to everybody who, who needs forgiving. Whether they deserve it or not, I'm going to give it because love is a sacrifice. Love is a sacrifice, folks. Right? Love is not, is not lust. Love is a sacrifice. Lust just lights the match. But after that, you've got to keep the fire burning, folks. Well, all right, I'll move on. So love, joy, peace. You want to have joy in your life? Last week we talked about in, uh, in uh, John 15, I think it is. 515? Anyway, anyway, it's in there in John somewhere. That uh, Jesus said, John 15, I believe. Jesus said that I am the vine and you are the 
branches, and when, we're, when, they're, when we have branches, those branches are there to produce fruit, right? And he said, if you remain in me, nothing will be impossible to you. The challenge that you and I have is remaining in him. I mean, we're fine for this one hour period on Sunday morning. We can remain in him. The problem is when you get outside and get behind the wheel. When you show up at work tomorrow, show up to school, or show up to wherever you're going, the question is, are you remaining in him, or have you now just morphed into that person that people expect you to be in that certain scenario? Have you noticed how people change based on who they're with? Or you can be rooted in the vine, and you can operate in the things of God and not change depending on who you're with, but change on depending on who's inside of you. Come on, somebody. And so if you want joy, Jesus said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Anything you ask for me is you're plugged into me, you can receive. And then he goes on to say in that very same passage, I'm telling you this so that your joy might be full. So if we want to have the fruit of the Spirit and have joy in our life, how does that work? We got to stay plugged into Jesus, y'all. Come on, say amen. We got to be plugged into the Lord. We, we can't be plugged into the world. We can't be plugged into Google. We can't be plugged into YouTube or Snapchat or Wink Wink or whatever else you're into. You know, if you think you're going to TikTok your way to heaven, it ain't going to happen. I'm telling you right now, of all social medias, I would consider that to be the most dangerous for many reasons, but I'm not here to talk about that. But I do want you to realize we got to know where our source is in our life. Is that right? The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. And the thing is that these seeds are present in our life, in the life of every believer, but they must be cultivated and used to become our new nature. What does the Bible say about your nature? It says in, in Corinthians, I don't have it on the screen, but it says uh, that when you are in Christ, you are a, what, what are you? You are a new creation. Everybody say, new creation. You're a new creation in Christ. And then it goes on to straighten you out. It says, behold, old things have passed away. And everything has become new. The challenge is, we want to keep resurrecting that old dead corpse of ours. And God says, don't let that thing plant anything in the garden of your heart. I'm planting something to bring potential into your life like you have no idea. Many of you just have no idea what God has planned for you if you would allow the seeds that God plants in you to begin to grow. You just don't, you just don't water them because you don't see the the, the, the future. You don't water them because you don't have a vision of what God is getting ready to do in your life. But I'm telling you today that you participate in what is about to happen in your life. One of the things I, I would hate to happen is to show up at the gates of heaven and find out that I left a bunch of stuff undone, that I left so much on the table that God would say to me, man, you could have done this. You could have done that. You could have been here. You could have, you know, changed this. You could have made such an impact if you'd only have watered the stuff that I put in your life. But instead, you watered some of the wrong plants. Anybody been watering some of the wrong stuff once in a while in our lives? But hey, today I'm telling you how not to do that. We're just going to begin to water some good things. Now, the Bible does tell us in Galatians a whole list of things that come out of our flesh. And these are the things that if we do these things or allow these things in our life, then we're sowing to the flesh. And, and all that we're going to benefit from is death. It's going to create death in us. So here's the list. I didn't put it on the screen because it's a nasty list. Sexual immorality, uncleanness, corruption, idolization, witchcraft, hatred, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, rebellions, and cliques. You know, uh, in, that, in that list, there's that word witchcraft, and it's referring to spiritual sorcery. It's referring to demonic control, okay? Just want you to get that phrase in your head, demonic control. Let me start this statement by saying simply, no one has the God-given right to control anyone else except the Holy Spirit. So just, I hope that sets you free. 
And if you're a control freak, I hope that encourages you to make, let go and let God. Wow, that's so corny, but you know what I mean. And so when we look at that word rich, witchcraft, it takes me back to a scripture in the Old Testament in 1 Samuel. And I want to show you the connection here between 1 Samuel and this list in Galatians mentioning witchcraft or demonic control. In 1 Samuel 15, here's what the Bible says, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Witchcraft is sorcery. It is demonic control. It is being motivated by a demonic force. It's allowing a spirit to overtake you. Have you ever seen somebody get into a fit of rage? You know, these days, road rage is a thing. Doesn't seem to be as bad as it was a few couple of years ago, but it's bad nonetheless. And you can see rage take over a person, and, and all of a sudden, there's a different look in their eye. They're, they're, they're a completely different human being if they're even a human being at that point. And so rebellion, when we have a rebellious spirit, you know, Jesus said in the kingdom, there are sheep and there's goats. And the goats are the rebellious, and they're the ones who will never follow the, sh the shepherd. Doesn't listen to the shepherd's voice, but goes off and does their own thing. They think they know better than God. And God says, if you're a sheep and you wander off, the shepherd's coming to look for you. But if you're a goat, he expects you to wander off because you're just a ding-dong. Rebellion and anything like it, um, being unable to submit to authority, proper God-given authority in your life, being unable to remain committed in certain things, all of that is born in the spirit of sorcery. I'm not trying to get spooky with you, but I do, this is what the Scripture is saying. And it goes on to say, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. So when you're stubborn about something and you refuse to budge, no matter what, even if you're wrong, it doesn't matter, you're going to dig your heel in and you're going to be stubborn. I know nobody in this room has that issue. The Bible says you're making an idol of that thing. And it's coming between you and God. So instead of us being rebellious and stubborn, and pointing our finger at everybody else and opening our mouth about everything we think online, we ought to drop to our knees. And we ought to give ourselves to heaven and say, God, I don't want to say or do anything that doesn't glorify you. Do you know how much better the world would be? Do you know how much better the internet would be? I don't want to say or do anything that doesn't glorify you, God. How many people think that that would be a way for us to begin to live our lives? I recognize that God, that, that the Bible digs the stuff out in us. There's another scripture in James chapter 3 and verse 16. And it, it simply says, for where envy and strife is, there is confusion. And watch this, every evil work comes right back to the same root word of sorcery, of demonic control, demonic spirit, where there's envy and strife, you create an environment where the devil begins to be glorified. When somebody comes into your life and it's just constant strife, they're always causing strife in your life, you got to know there's every evil work at play. If you're a person who just loves to stir it up, you got the spiritual gift of gaslighting. That's an evil work. And God says, let that stuff go. Stop trying to control everybody with your moods and your attitudes. Fall to your knees and let some humility and humbleness lead you to the place that God wants to lead you so that you can be great. You don't realize that the strife you're causing and the envy that you're having and the stubbornness that you've locked yourself down into, you don't realize that all that has done is kept you small. You think it's made you tall, but it's kept you small. But today I want you to know God wants to take you so much higher. So we need to begin to turn away for, from some things. I want to read Galatians chapter 6 and verse 8. Paul says, whoever sows to please the flesh... From the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit 
from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in well-doing, for at the proper time, we will reap a harvest. If we do not give up, there's a harvest. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those that belong to the family of believers. Paul is saying to us today, you can sow to the Spirit or you can sow to the flesh, but here's how to sow to the Spirit. And again, again, listen to the Scripture. The Scripture is telling you, you can sow to the Spirit. Here's how you sow to the Spirit. You continue to do good. Don't become weary in well-doing, the Bible says, right? But because at the proper time, you will reap the harvest of that. And I know sometimes, you know, I've been doing good and doing good and doing good. And it just seems like every, every evildoer from here to Timbuktu is having the, a time of their life and having a great heyday. And I'm just hanging on to what I'm hanging on to, trying to get through what I'm getting through. And I'm like, man, it's getting old. Have you ever said that? It's getting old. And God says, don't be weary in well-doing, and don't fret over the evildoer who seems to prosper, for the day will come when they will be tossed into the fire. But you will be trees planted by the river of living water. Don't, don't give up. Don't give in. Don't stop doing good. Somebody didn't notice what you did. It doesn't matter. God noticed what you did. God knows the good you did. God knows when you got tired and it was hard and you still did the right thing. God knows when you were tempted and you were tempted and you were tempted, but you still did the right thing. He knows. And he said, you will reap a harvest of blessing in your life. You will rise above all the others. You'll begin to live a life that others only dream of living because you were able and ready to pay the price in private so that you could enjoy the blessing in public. You want to have a great home, great marriage, great family. Those are the things God plants in us, but it comes from what we, what we allow to flourish. We want that harvest. I want that harvest. You want that harvest. And sometimes it looks like the harvest ain't coming or there's a big problem with the harvest. Don't worry. Can I just give you some advice? I didn't give anybody else this advice. Again, I need to charge extra for this, but... Don't worry about the harvest. The harvest is not your problem. Your problem is to cultivate the seed. Keep watering it with the word. Keep watering it with the word of God. What does the word of God say? Just repeat the words of God, and that waters the seed that God has planted in you. You know who has to worry about the harvest? The Lord of the harvest. God is the Lord of the harvest. You just keep doing the right thing. You keep planting the right seed. You keep making the right choices. You keep staying strong in God. You stay humble in the Lord. Come on. And God begins to do other things in you that you couldn't make happen. Well, I guess our time is kind of up. Let me just read this last scripture in Philippians chapter 2, and then I'll let you go. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but much now, uh, much more now in my absence, Watch this now. Continue to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. God has a good purpose that he is fulfilling. God is in the process. God is about to take you to the next place so he can fulfill his purpose. His purpose has not been fulfilled yet. You know how I know that? you're still breathing. When you go to heaven, job done. While you're here, he's still bringing your purpose out. 